Welcome to episode 56 of the G2 on 5G. It's the latest inside scoop on everything 5G. We cover six topics in about 15 minutes, and it's brought to you by More Insights and Strategy. I'm Will Townsend, and joining me again this week is fellow analyst Anshul Sag. Let's get started with my first topic. So this week, Nokia refreshed its Airscale 5G RAN portfolio. Uh, this has been an issue for the company for quite some time. They uh, initially focused on FPGA, and um, so this refresh transitions the portfolio, their ReShark portfolio to a system on a chip. And this is gonna do a number of things for, for their RAM portfolio. One, it is going to provide better performance and better scalability. Uh, what I find most interesting though is power management. So um, I actually participated on a, on a call this week with other analysts. And um, Tommy Udo, who uh, basically uh, manages their entire um, portfolio, mentioned um, that they expect up to a 75% uh, power uh, improvement over its uh, current generation. And that's going to be game changing for operators when you think about the expense that's required to run these networks. So the big question is, is this going to allow it to better compete with Ericsson and Samsung Networks. And by the way, Samsung Networks hasn't traditionally been strong in the radio access network area. So I think it will it will take some time for, for Nokia to make up some ground here. But I thought this is, uh, it's definitely a move in the right direction. And this is a pretty significant announcement for them. What it also does is, given their prior roadmap, um, they were they were focused on supporting um, you know 4G and 5G discreetly, and with this new refresh, this gives them one platform to support all of the Gs. So from an efficiency and an engineering standpoint, it's going to be a benefit to them as well. I don't know, Angel, do you have any uh, any insights here? Um, I, I think it's something that we're seeing a lot of the industry do, which is moving towards custom SOCs, mm -hmm. um, and it kind of leads into my next topic. Um, but I would say that in general, uh, we're seeing a lot more of these purpose built SOCs rather than trying to build FPGAs yeah. and hoping that you can uh, constantly rejigger your your designs uh, in your FPGAs to fit uh, whatever needs your customers have. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, I, I think that if you can build a good platform on an SOC, it's better, but that requires a lot more. Uh, engineering effort um, yeah. and it seems like it, it may have been worth it for them um, but I, I believe that uh, you know Nokia isn't necessarily building their own SOCs uh, I believe they're sourcing theirs um, but uh, there are other players who are building their own so that yeah that yeah well, well, to my topic <laughs> yeah yeah well that that's a good segue to your topic and because you want to talk about Samsung 5G chipsets right yeah, so on, I want to say Tuesday, uh, Samsung had a pretty big uh, uh, Samsung Networks Redefined event. And mm -hmm. as part of that event, they announced a bunch of new, um, you know, VRAN, uh, vCore, network management solutions, everything. But one of the things they announced were in-house chipsets, um, which included their third generation RFICs second generation 5G modem and a digital front end RFIC integrated chip. So mm -hmm. um, Samsung is building a lot of stuff for themselves, uh, which they have a very long history of doing in almost every single business. Um, they are one of the, if not the leading manufacturer of semiconductors in the world, mm -hmm. uh, when you consider what they build for others as well as what they build for themselves. Um, and they have been on this road to continually improve what their equipment can do. And a big component of that is building their own SOCs and their own modems yeah. for what they need in their infrastructure and what they believe their customers will want. And I think that this year has really shown the momentum that Samsung Networks has. Um, and them building out these new chipsets is a, um, a new way to refresh its portfolio and to ensure that they stay competitive with the rest of the market. Yeah, I mean, certainly um, leaning into its semiconductor capability gives it um, 
a source of differentiation relative to, to Ericsson and Nokia. You know, you mentioned with Nokia and ReefShark that uh, some of that, you know, if not most of that um, effort is, is outsourced. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, Samsung Networks has come a long way in the last couple of years. I mean, moving out of their, you know, sort of their core Asian, you know, market and, you know, really um, solidifying that, that growth with, you know, initially Verizon with its uh, with its 5G rollouts, you know, here in the United States, and uh, so I expect to see you know more momentum, you know, come come out of that. So, um, but let's let's go to my second topic, and there's sort of a segue into that. You know, Samsung obviously they're the South Korean you know hometown hero, and Root Metrics came out this week, and they looked at South Korea, the United States, they looked, I believe, at the United Kingdom, mm-hmm. and um, I. I don't recall if it was China or just Pan Asia um, in this in a snapshot, but basically they, you know, they've determined and identified South Korea as, you know, an overall leader in 5G deployment um, based on a number of, um, you know, things that they've conducted. And this is no surprise to me. Um, almost exactly two years ago, you and I and Patrick Moorhead, our principal, wrote a six-part series on who was leading in 5G at the time. And um, one of the articles that I contributed there was, was carrier leadership. And I identified SK Telecom even two years ago in South Korea as, as a leader, if not the world leader. And so um, I'll take my victory lap, you know, with root metrics supporting, you know, what I, what I said two years ago. But, uh, but certainly if you look at just the, the number of subscribers on 5G, you look at the, uh, the deployment of the networks there, and you look at some really innovative services that have been mainly focused in the consumer space, but we're beginning to see some enterprise use cases in, in that market as well. They certainly are doing things very well. And I wonder if you have any additional perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, I would say that it makes sense that Korea would be among the, the top because they were one of the first networks to launch. So they've had the most time to improve, but also they started with mid-band. Um, which means that they, you know, they've had some challenges with coverage, um, but even even in Seoul, by the looks of it, they have 93.2% 5G availability, mm-hmm. which is admittedly, Korea is a much smaller country. Yeah. Um, so they, they have less area to cover. Um, but the fact that, you know, LGU plus, uh, SK Telecom and KT all, you know, they all had above 95% availability. So mm-hmm. I, I think, and you know, they're 400 megabits per second average speeds. Um, uh, you know, it's real hard to compete with that. Yeah. So I, I think that they, they, they went with the right approach early and some other countries have also gone with mid-band like, like uh, Saudi Arabia, and they've done very well as well. And same with UAE. Sure. So I think it shows that mid-band is really the sweet spot for 5G. Mm-hmm. And I do think that millimeter wave is going to have applications that other countries are going to wish they had. Yeah. Um, but I think we won't really realize those until we have more population density in places where, where we're used to having it. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I'll also add to you in that six-part series that our firm uh, published on Forbes two years ago, we also talked about consortia and government involvement, and um, and I actually I wrote that I contributed to that article as well, and and certainly the South Korean government has been um, very forward-thinking, and um, I think, you know, with respect to how they've handled spectrum options and that sort of thing, they got ahead of the the curve as well. And they are really, um, you know, a model to point to with respect to other parts of the world that might be lagging in 5G deployment, like Europe. But in Europe, you've got different challenges because each country individually manages, um, you know, sure. the auctioning and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, we'll certainly keep tabs, um, you know, on on that particular market. But um, they are, if you want to call it, you know, the 5G war, you know, they are. <laughs> They are certainly, you know, out ahead of that. So, but let's shift focus and uh, let's let's handle your second topic this week. You want to talk about China Mobile and subscribership? Yeah. So speaking of the five G race, um, China Mobile is one of the largest operators in the world. Um, they have a current user base of four nine hundred forty two 
1.8 million users, which is a ton. Mm -hmm. um, and they added 16.65 million subscribe 5G subscribers in May, which is a lot of subscribers by any means. Um, but what's interesting is that moves their total 5G subscriber base to 221.95 million, which means that they have almost 225 million subscribers on 5G as one carrier, mm -hmm. um, which is a big deal because I think by the end of this year, we'll, we'll probably see, um, you know, upwards of 300 million just from them alone. Yeah. Um, and this 220, almost 222 million number uh, is compared to 55.6 last year. So they've managed to quadruple their in user base year. in a year yeah. of 5G. So clearly 5G is rapidly growing in China and China Mobile is obviously uh, you know, selling a good amount of 5G devices as well as encouraging people to move over to a 5G network plan. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I believe that you know, China Mobile knows that the economics of 5G will significantly improve their profitability the faster that they get more the majority of their users over to 5G just yeah. because spectral efficiency and, and all those other things as well as being able to offer new services and, and you know, take advantage of standalone whenever that comes to, to bear there. Um, but it's just a big deal. I, I think that, you know, just one, one carrier having that many 5G subscribers is already a big deal. Obviously there's, you know, there's caveats, but you know, how these are counted and all those kinds of things. But uh, I'm sure that the real number is not far off from there. Yeah, no, it's impressive, especially when you compare it to the, uh, to the United States and just, you know, the number of subscribers here and uh, you know, and, you know, I've been following, um, you know, sort of their activities and they've been very aggressive on not charging huge premiums to move folks over from, from LTE to 5G. So I think that has a lot to do with it as well. I, you know, time will tell, you know, with, as, you know, the operators in the United States roll out 5G, how, how they're going to go approach that. But um, certainly, you know, it shouldn't, and from my perspective, you know, you know, access is one thing, but then the discrete service capabilities uh, are the real, in, in my mind, you know, the, the, the real opportunities to, to monetize. So, but we'll definitely keep our eyes peeled on this. And uh, let's move into my third topic um, and final topic for the week. And you and I got some care packages from, from T-Mobile. Um, I, I received a bottle of 5G gin, 5, 5G gin and 5G ginger beer. And uh, this was to celebrate um, their their milestone in covering. Um, I, I believe, like, correct me if I'm wrong. How many how many subscribers do they claim to with 5G? Yeah, 100 million, and they're making 300 million, and they're making tremendous progress on you know their their rural commitments as well. And I thought it was funny. Like, um, I was following this on social when it broke on Wednesday, and. And AT and T's response on their on their Twitter handle was really question mark. You know, it's like, so you know, uh, it, what what I you know what what I love about about T Mobile is just you know their 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 marketing is is fun. You know, we we receive both you and I we talked about the Betty Crocker layer cake kit that we received, and then we received um, a Snuggie for for Spectrum blanket coverage, and and now the gin and the ginger beer. So. Um, I think it's a clever way for them to um, continue to kind of um, promote their, their their leadership as their competitors are, you know, beginning to kind of narrow and, you know, close the gap there. So, uh, so I'm, I'm assuming you received both in the mail too, right? Yeah, it was, it was interesting because I got them separately. So I got the ginger beer first. Okay. So I was kind of confused. And then I, and then I realized what was coming yeah. and then I got the whole kit. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to take part in their uh, their cocktail hour that they had. Uh, I was able to watch it, but I didn't have all the things with me. But uh, it was interesting because they, you know, they 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 had a nice little session, you know, teaching people how to make their cocktails. But yeah. in general, I think it's a good. I mean, it's not a bad thing to celebrate that you've covered ninety percent of the country uh, yeah. with five G. Uh, obviously, that last ten percent is going to be the hardest, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that T-Mobile seems very committed to enabling that both with low band and mid band. So we'll see how that kind of pans out over the next couple of years as their competitors try to catch up on coverage. 
Yeah, and apparently um, you can purchase this stuff. It's limited edition. And um, if you go to T-Mobile's website, you can find out more details if you'd like to order some T-Mobile ginger beer or 5G, 5G gen. So, um, but let's move to your third and final topic this week. And we're talking a lot about the South Korean market. And so I caught this as well, and actually I tweeted about it, but um, South Korea has some very aggressive goals for, for 6G, even ahead of 3GPP standardization, right? Yeah, so they um, they are saying that they're going to have the world's first commercial 6G network by 2028. And what's interesting about that is we expect to have a new G every 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and the new G was supposed to be 2020. We got in 2019. Um, so the expectation was 2030 will be the next G as well. Uh, and so... For it, being, for it to be two years earlier is pretty significant. Um, and the Korean government has actually unveiled a plan saying that they will already invest $200 million uh, into the development of 6G, uh, which has not yet been, yet been standardized and yeah. will not be for the foreseeable future, but they believe that they will be able to standardize it within the next five years, which I think is obviously very ambitious um, and a lot of the core technologies right now around um, around 6G is terahertz in terms of yeah. the frequencies. Um, and, Sam and Samsung was one of the companies that obviously has been driving this um, with the Ch Korean government as well as others in the, in the space. But uh, during Samsung's event, they did talk about 6G as well. Mm -hmm. And they talked about how they were testing uh, 140 gigahertz wireless links uh, for 6G. So there are already tests going on and there's a lot of development happening uh, in parallel with 5G, which is to be expected. Um, yeah. And yeah, and I think we're going to start hearing a lot more about 6G over the next maybe week or so as MWC starts to roll through um, and we'll start to, you know, have a lot of announcements that we'll talk about on the next podcast. So yeah. I, I think that kind of wraps things up. Um, and I'll kind of just wrap things up with our with our nice outro. Uh, we hope our viewers and listeners found this week's topics interesting. If anyone out there would like to provide insight on a specific 5G topic for a future podcast, please reach out to us on social media. Will is at Welltown Tech and I'm at Anshel Sog. We hope you have a great weekend and please tune in again next week.